Museum is getting a rare addition to its collection. Jason Ostell is live at Gillespie Field with details on the last flying Viking. He explains that. Hey, Jason. Hey, guys. Yeah. Um, Jim Kidrick literally just walked up to the president and CEO of the Air and Space Museum. Jim, thanks for having us out today. This is really exciting. Talk about the significance of this. Well, it really is. And, of course, uh, this airplane's coming home. You know, NAS North Island had S3s for years. And I've cruised with S3s. I've tanked behind S3s. So, uh, you know, it's a, an extremely versatile airplane. It's cool. Uh, as I told you a minute ago, there's nothing like being around a fleet airplane for a fleet aviator. Uh, so it excited everybody, and we had a big group yesterday. Uh, uh, you know, all the, what we would call the S3 bubbas, you know, in the area. I started calling them social media. You know, David was uh, extended. And so they started showing up. So there is a huge uh, contingent of people in San Diego that are... They want to have kind of a group hug, sure. so we're going to do some things to this airplane. It may not look NASA in its final form. It may go back to Navy. We're still kind of working on, on those kinds of things because of its long history, you know, with our Navy right here in San Diego. What was the process like coming into possession of this aircraft? Well, it's kind of strange, you know, uh, all of a sudden because we have friends in the area, you know, it's kind of like somebody hears that, okay, this airplane may be coming up for uh, being available, and, and you know me, okay, I said, We'll take it, okay? Yeah. Not, so we so we just started this this process, and ultimately we got it, and they selected San Diego. So we had a lot of people behind the scenes working with us, for us, on our behalf, and uh, it's just kind of cool that uh, that they would do that. I'm looking at the main landing gear because the main landing gear, by the way, are the same as an A7 Corsair. Is that right? Oh yeah, this airplane. Uh, you almost cannot make a hard landing. I mean, I shouldn't tell all this kind of stuff, but it's very cool. Yeah, it is very cool. Yeah, it is. So what is the significance of this airplane going forward for the museum? Well, um, it's number one is it's out here at Gillespie Field. We're going to make it extremely accessible. Uh, we haven't made a decision. Do we want to take wings off and get it back down to the main? But we may just make it, uh, you know, make it... Uh, uh, is residency here because we can do a lot for kids and and you know all those that we want to inspire uh, you know as you know out on the flight line we've got a pretty healthy inventory of airplanes you know our Tomcat is out there which we're looking at perhaps putting in front of the museum in place of the Sea Dart you know we're looking at uh, a lot of initiatives that we think could be uh, very cool but we've got a Harrier out here I mean all sorts of great stuff so as we grow Gillespie uh, and and heighten its impact on our community the S3 can kind of be a cornerstone stone to that because as you know that's like the engine i mean this is a it came in fully ready to fly matter of fact you know i always say a pilot's biggest fear how do i start it so let's get in and go <laughs> all right jim kidrick he is the president and ceo of the air and space museum this is the last airworthy s3 on the planet had its last flight yesterday really bittersweet for the sweet for the guys who were flying it there were some there were some guys with tears yesterday you know, it brings back memories. And once again, you know, fleet aviators around fleet airplanes, it just there's just something about it. And that sound oh. when they spool the throttles, that Hoover, that unmistakable sound. That's why they call it the Hoover. Absolutely, because on the ball, and I did this for Paul earlier, so I shouldn't do this as it's kind of silly, but it's a hoo, 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 and you hear it, so you know instant. Yep. It's it's the S3. Yeah. And the Viking has, like I said, a glorious history with us, a very multi-purpose jet. Uh, this is a type that you'd want to say, uh, hey, let's go flying today and just have a good time. Yeah. All right, Jim Kidrick, thanks for having us out here. Oh when I heard about this, I'm like, I, I called it right away. I'm going. I got to well, go. You can see this is... It's, it's beautifully done, yeah. It's, it's extremely pretty, and, um, and it uh, flies fast. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So, Paul and Lauren, this is going to be around for quite some time. It'll be uh, education and outreach for kids. And like you said, the, the, the men and women that flew these things are going to come out and have a look and relive some old memories. Group hug. All right. Back to you guys in the studio, Paul, Lauren. Jason, one question, just because I've watched a lot of uh, the aircraft specials on the military channel about this particular plane being a refueler. How many jets could a, plane, could a Viking refuel? before it itself had to come down and get more gas. Okay, so these were used for as tankers, for refueling, yeah. right? Okay, so Paul is saying how many planes could one of these...
top off, but it take, that's a, there's all kinds of different it airplanes. All depends, it all depends on whether or not you're going to double cycle, triple cycle. Okay, but he, he could top off probably six airplanes, uh, depending on what top off was. If you took a thousand to two hundred thousand pounds of fuel, it wasn't uncommon if you had a long mission to punch off the carrier, rendezvous with the tanker, top yourself off. So now you you've left the ship environment. You know, completely full. Uh, in that case, you're probably only going to take 1,000 to 2,000 pounds. If you're coming back or you need a, a mid-cycle tank, you might take as much as three, four, five thousand 5,000 pounds. Or if you're flying a Phantom. Well, the Phantom. <laughs> we talk about that all the time. We, well, we do. <laughs> the famous words of, a tank, of, of an F-4 off the, off the, uh, the cat, uh-huh. tanker paused it. Okay. He wanted fuel right now and he, pretty much the whole flight. You yeah. know, if a tanker flew by him, he'd rendezvous yeah. and take. That's great. All right. So anyway, um, there's an answer to your question, cycles and things like that. Jason, I, I was curious because it sounded like he left the door open a little bit, but th- is there any chance that, that this Viking S3 could go to the Air and Space Museum or it's definitely staying at Gillespie Field and we have to see it there? <laughs> Yeah, David Neville and I from the Air and Space Museum were just talking about this. This airplane is massive. But Lauren is wondering if this plane might possibly go into the Balboa Park Air and Space Museum. We don't, we don't know yet. Uh, it's not small, no. okay, and we have limited access. You know, now we have a Hornet down there, as you know, and we strategically know how to take these things apart, okay, if we want to get something in. So we just haven't made those decisions yet. You know, the biggest challenge we have is, I always say, is today is tomorrow's history. Yeah. So as we build build up our, our artifacts, our assets, our aircraft, whatever, Balboa Park doesn't seem to be getting bigger. Now, uh, I'm ready to do the expansion, about 81, 82,000 square feet, mm-hmm. and we could do some super stuff right here in, uh, in our region, even more than we do today. Good. Give me another reason to come out to the museum and do reports. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> I'm just always looking for an excuse. Give me a reason to go see the Air and Space Museum All right. again. He's saying there's a chance. Thanks, that's, that's what I there heard. There is a chance. That's <laughs> what I heard. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jason. Yep. Very cool. There is a chance.